countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Vital Factor by Nelson Bond. I doubt that anywhere on earth there's a man or woman or a child who doesn't know the name Wayne Crowder. I doubt whether there's a human being who hasn't at one time or another used one of the Crowder products. The can opener or the razor blade or the patented tooth powder dispenser or the Crowder improved slideless fastener. In the magazines which write about men of business, Crowder was described as a man of ice and stone and ink and steel. No warmth to his blood. And a heart to pump, not feel human emotion. And he built a battery of buttons into his desk so that when he wanted something, all he ever had to do was press a button, and like genies springing out of the bottle, the proper personnel would come running. Yes, Mr. Crowder? Get me my engineers. Yes, sir. Right away, Mr. Crowder. Here are your engineers, sir. All right. Close the door and get out. Now, gentlemen, sit down. Gentlemen, I want you to build me a spaceship. A spaceship, sir? That's right. I've decided that I'm going to be the man who gives space flight to mankind. Any questions? Sir, we can design such a ship. That part isn't too hard. Yes? But, but we've no way of providing the motor to power such a ship. When the ship's ready to fly, there'll be a motor. Sir, I I don't like to contradict you, but you can't go ahead of the total technology of a historical period. It's like asking somebody in 1600 to build the internal combustion engine. You see... Scientists have been searching for a motive power for spaceships for decades now without success. You'll have a ship, but we can't lift that ship from the Earth's surface. That is, not to the point of free flight at any rate. Mr. Crowder, <clears throat> uh, you see you'll be spending millions of dollars, hundreds of millions perhaps, for nothing. What's your name? Phillips, sir. You're fired. Go down to the cashier and draw your pay and get out. What, sir? Get out. Nobody who works for me thinks of how much something costs. We use money. We don't let expense provide a rationalization for not beginning a project. All right, Phillips. I give you permission to leave. Right now. Any other comments? The ship will be built, of course, Mr. Crowder. The fact still remains we can't power it. You design the ship, I'll find the motor for you. Where, sir? I don't know. But somewhere in the world, there's a man who does know the secret. I want that motor, and I'll root out the man who has the theory which will let us build it. How quickly do you want this done, sir? Yesterday. Yes, sir. Is there anything you need? We'll need a construction yard, sir, and certain machinery, and a great many materials, of course. Uh, labor force. Get them. Send me the bills. I don't want to be bothered with minor details. Yes, sir. And, uh, one more thing, sir. Phillips. Yes, we need him, sir. He's a top man on electronics. He's a vital cog in our team. I don't want Phillips working for me. That's clear, I hope. Who else in the country knows what he does? No one in this country, sir. There's a man in India, though. Get him. We've tried before, Mr. Crowder. He's working on an important project in his country. I'm not it... concerned with details. Get that man, pay him what he wants, but get him. Sir, you don't understand. If this man quits his job, that whole project will collapse. 
It means the welfare of many people, millions of people in his country. He has a high sense of patriotism. Buy that sense of patriotism. That's all. I don't want to see any of you again until you have a report of work in progress. Yes, sir. Miss Holmes, there's a man named Phillips going to draw his pay. I want two company policemen to meet him at the cashier's office and escort him from there directly off the premises, and I want them to be emphatic about it. Yes, Mr. Carter. And notify the newspapers, the television, and the radio networks, the periodicals, and the scientific journals that I'll receive the press in my office this afternoon at 3.30. I have an important announcement to make. Anyone not here at 3.30 will be barred, and the publication or company he represents will not be given any further information. (laughs) Gentlemen, you can finish your drinks later. Gentlemen of the press and ladies, it's my pleasure to be able to tell you that I'm in the process of constructing a spaceship. Any questions? Did you say spaceship? That's right. That's what I thought you said. I knew the drinks weren't that strong. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Crowder, is this spaceship under construction now? It is. You solved the problem of motive force then? No, sir. Well, what sort of... You mean you have no means of propulsion for this spaceship? That problem is not solved as yet. <laughs> oh. It will be... That's why I called you in this afternoon. I want you to announce that I have $100,000 in cash, waiting for the man or woman who first brings me the basic idea for such a motor. I'll supply all equipment for research and construction, and I'll see that the rights of the inventor are protected and more than adequate royalties will be paid him or her. That's all I have to say now. Mr. Crowder, one more question, please. Yes? Yes? Do you have a name for this spaceship yet? No, not yet. Well, then let me suggest one. Yes? Crowder's Folly. <laughs> ah! Quiet. All of you, quiet. <laughs> what is your paper? The Daily Times, sir. Miss Holmes, inform the company police that under no circumstances is any representative of the Daily Times ever to be allowed on company property again. Strike that paper from the list of those to be invited to future conferences. It was Crowder's folly, but the word of what he wanted circulated to the far corners of the globe... It was known in the white ice block huts of the Eskimos and in the grass-thatched villages of Central Africa, as well as places less remote. And the Crowder office became the mecca and the heaven for the lunatic fringe of humanity. Their blueprints and scale models clogged its corridors. I told you I don't want these people in my office till they're screened. Now get out, get out! Uh, Every time I open that door, they surge in like a tidal wave. I have a progress report for you, sir. The ship is finished as far as we can go, Mr. Crowder. Certain additional construction can't be done now because it depends on the shape and mass of the engine, on the type of fuel, on the weight of that fuel. I see. All right. Lay off everybody we don't need. I've ordered that. Uh, Mr. Crowder, is it possible that no one will turn up with a motor? That's the one thing that's not possible. He will come. Money and determination will buy anything. Close the door on your way out. Yes, sir. Miss Holmes, order the proper department to put a name on the forward end of the ship. I want letters in pure gold one foot high. The name of the ship is Crowder's Folly. Get it done today. The sun came up in the morning, and the sun set at night, glinting rose on the silver sheen of the hollow ship's skin as it lay in the yard. The golden letters on the prow spelled out the fury of Crowder for the world to see. 
A staff of 50 were employed as time went on in taking rust preventative measures to ensure the ship's well-being. The staff of 50 worked in three shifts around the clock, armed with oil cans and grease cans and other containers and sprayers of preservatives. In a year, the first experiment seemed ready to bear fruit, and a test was held. The atomic fission motor. In exactly 45 seconds now, we'll hold the test, Mr. Crowder. The sound you hear is our generators here, building up power to supply the motor by remote control. If this needle goes round to the part of the dial marked in red, there'll be an explosion. Are there any questions, sir? Proceed with the tests. Watch the needle, sir. 8,000, 8,500, 9,000, 10, 11, 12, 15. That's an overload now, sir. 18, 20. I don't know how much more it can... What happened? The generator blew out. What kind of a compensation? I see? beg your pardon, sir. The motor blew up. What are you talking about? I would have heard. You see, sir, it takes a while for the vibrations of an explosion to travel three miles and then reach through 15 feet of concrete. I see. Well, there are other experiments in progress. Let me know when they're ready for testing. Yes, sir. Mr. Crowder, the inventor of that motor had to be right with it, of course, during the tests. He had a family. The fool knew what he was doing. He understood the danger. He was paid enough to be able to afford insurance. The cost of insurance on such a project was prohibitive, sir. Well, if his wife was thrifty, she saved out of what he earned this last year. His salary was relatively small, sir. Most of the money went for the research. He should have demanded an adequate salary. I haven't stated on money. The fool failed. I have no further responsibility. Yes, sir. You want us to continue screening applicants? Of course. All right. Make a settlement on the widow. And don't turn anyone away if he seems to have the remotest possibility of success. I'm telling you, my man will come. Money and determination will buy anything. And strangely enough, Crowder was right. Because one day there came to his office a stranger, a small man. He looked even smaller in that tremendous room. He was an unusual visitor in that he carried no briefcase fat with blueprints or formulae. He was unusual in that he neither blustered, cowered, nor deferred to his host. He was a pleasant little stranger, bird-like of eye and movement, bright and smiling. Mr. Crowder, my name is Wilkins. I can power that ship you want. So? Of course, what I have in mind won't be anything like that meaningless, huge bullet your engineers built for you. Rockets are a foolish waste of time, sir. My motor requires a different sort of vessel. Where are your plans? Right here, in my head. It so happens that I am presently supporting half a dozen people who make the same claims. None of them have been successful. What makes you think your idea will work? Simple enough, sir. The common magnet. Huh? Electromagnetism. Utilization of the force of gravity, or its opposite in this case, counter gravity. Oh, no. Oh, thank you very much. Now, if you'll forgive me now... Uh, just one moment, Mr. Crowder. There's one thing more. This. Now, I've seen pieces of metal before. Thank you. How high from your desk would you say that I'm holding it? I'm very sorry, Mr. Wilkins. Now, do you want to leave or do you want to be escorted out? Now, this will only take a second, sir. How high from your desk would you say that I'm holding this piece of metal? A foot and a half, I'd say. And if I let go, then in less than a second, a fraction of a second, it should fall to your desk. Now, look, I don't want the surface of that desk marred. But will it be? You see, I have let go of the metal, is that right? Good Lord. Mm. Many seconds ago, it should have crashed to the desk, am I right? Well, this is incredible. Well, if you want to speak to me anymore, I'll be right outside. But... It hasn't fallen. That's right, sir. It hasn't fallen. It floats in the air. That's right, sir. It floats in the air. How do you do it? Why don't you call your engineers and ask them? I'll wait outside. Miss Holmes, 
Get me my engineers. Immediately. All right, Mr. Wilkins, you're quite right. The piece of metal is apparently counter-gravity. And my engineers can give me no explanation. Thank you, sir. Now, what do you want? For my services? Yes. You've already set the price. To build a pilot model based on this sample, no great expenditure, a hundredth of the cost of your behemoth sitting out there in your building yard. Three other things. A workshop, expert mechanical assistance, and an answer to one question. What is your question? Why do you want so much to build this ship? Frankly, because I love power. Because I'm ambitious. I want to be the first to conquer space... Because if I can do it, it'll make me greater, richer, stronger than any man has ever been. I want to be the master, not only of one world, but of worlds. Mm -hmm. That's an honest answer. But is it the only one? You see those letters in gold on the prow of my ship? Crowder's Folly, that's what they named it. That's what they think of me. I want to cram those words down their petty little throats. And let them eat mud. That's another answer. And that's all? That is as far as your thinking goes? What other answer is there to your question? There's my own answer. I want to leave this planet and go elsewhere. To Mars, perhaps. Because there are strange wonders yet to be found. Because there will be scarlet sunsets over barren wastes. And in the star-strewn night, the thin, cold air of a dying world, stirring in restless sighs across the valleys... Of the dry canals. <laughs> well, you may laugh out loud if you wish, Mr. Crowder. I would prefer that to the peculiar repressed smile you're now exhibiting. <laughs> you're a very lucky man, Mr. Wilkins, in that you have scientific talent. Because your talents as a poet are inferior and very sentimental. All right. You're a sentimentalist, and I'm a man of action. No matter. We can work together, you and I. Your workshop will be ready by morning. I don't need to hear from you again till you have something to show me. If you need to see me, call me day or night. I'll be available. But don't bother me with details, because I probably won't understand what you're talking about anyhow. If you need money or materials or personnel, just tell my engineers. You'll get it, or I'll know the reason why. That's all. Thank you, sir. Miss Holmes, get me my engineers. Yes, Mr. Crowder? We have 50 men working on preserving that useless hulk out there in the construction yards. Lay them off. Well, the How ship many will others... deteriorate if we do that, sir. Let it rot. Lay them off. Yes, sir. How many other employees are still working for us on the project? About uh, 3,000, sir, including the people working on experimental motors. Get rid of them. Sir? Get rid of them. Mr. Crowder, I... I never thought you'd drop this project. You were so adamant I'm not dropping anything but Deadwood. You saw what Wilkins had to offer. He's my man. And the rest is junk and nonsense. Mr. Crowder, he might fail. We ought to have a minimum of protection against... I say he won't fail. I know the goods when I see it. The rest is nonsense. Several of the experimenters were making much greater progress than I thought was possible. There are great opportunities there. I'm not interested. Not only in the field of spaceships, sir. One man has a motor no bigger than a football, which will drive an automobile 24 hours on four cents worth of fuel. It's almost finished, sir. Not interested. It will be of great benefit to mankind, sir. Your name will go down... My name will go down in history for this spaceship. The profits in such a motor, sir. I have more money now than I even know how to count. And when I make my space flight, I'll have more than that. Yes, sir. You just lay everybody off that isn't needed. Give them two weeks' pay and... My thanks for a thankless job well done. And that's all. Yes, sir, I'll get it done, sir. Oh, one more thing. There's no need to let the folly rot. Dismantle it. Sell the basic materials we don't need. Salvage whatever will be useful to us. That's all. A year's work. Yes. In ten years or twenty years, and I do the same thing. That's why you're an engineer, and I'm an executive. That's why you work for me. Because when I have to... I can be ruthless with my own mistakes. 
When a thing has lost its usefulness to me, I get rid of it. Well? I was just thinking, Mr. Crowder, what would happen to me if my usefulness to you were over? I've worked for you 20 years now. Uh, Just don't give me any occasion to consider your usefulness terminated. That oughtn't to be too hard. Hmm. What? Uh, Nothing, sir. I'll make the arrangements at once. Who are you? What do you want? I tried to stop him, sir. Well, speak up, man. My name is Jarvis Ustuli. I'm an electronics expert. Oh, yes, I remember. You're the Indian. Come in, come in. Do you want me, sir? I I can never... Never mind, Miss Holmes. Just stay outside. Close the door behind you. Sit down, Miss Ustuli. Thank you, no. I want to give you a gift before I leave. Oh? You leaving? I thought we still needed you. I resigned. Sorry to hear that. I'm told you're a good man. I want you to understand what's behind this gift. I was working on a power project in my country which would have meant a tremendous rise in the standard of living for millions of my people. I was unable to resist the money you offered. Well, had you resisted, even more money would have been forthcoming. I placed no limit on your worth to me. I understand. But you see, I did not come without a sense of guilt because there was no one in my country who could take my place. I would assume that. And now I discover that what I did was for nothing. The spaceship on which I worked is being dismantled. That's right. So I have been corrupted by you at a whim. I think you have too much power, sir. I think you use your power for evil, selfish purposes. Selfish, yes. Evil, no. Only sentimentality is evil. I think otherwise, And so, in order that you shall not corrupt anyone else, I have this gift for you. Here you are, sir. (laughs) And just one more shot for good measure to make sure you're really dead. Good. Miss Holmes, there's a man on his way out by the name of Jarvis Ustley, an engineer. He's not to be molested. He probably won't stop at the cashier, so I want a check for six months' salary in advance mailed to his home address. The man uh, showed a certain quality of ruthlessness, which is deserving of recognition. Oh, and uh, have the chief of the company police bring me a new bulletproof vest. This one seems to have been dented in a couple of places. The new spaceship, according to Wilkins' plans, as executed by Crowder's engineers, was finished within four months. It was small, it was shaped like a disc. It gleamed brightly even in the smoky haze of an October sunset. Inside, Crowder and Mr. Wilkins, in a small cubicle at the heart of the machine, sat surrounded by many instruments of a complicated nature. Outside, huge crowds gathered to witness the test. They stirred and murmured, waiting restlessly, as inside the control room of the craft, Wilkins installed the final secret part he had not revealed to those who built his driving apparatus. Well, Wilkins, what's holding us up? Nothing new. Oh, sentiment, perhaps? A wish to look once more on Earth's familiar scenes? Yeah. Now the screening is removed. Look. Look at the people out there. Never mind looking out there. Let's leave that thing closed. You're a sentimental fool. Or are you afraid? Or did you decide at the last minute that your invention would work? It will work. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Crowder. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Do me a favor. When I press this button, will you please press the button on the arm of the chair in which you're seated? I'll tell you when. Turn on your motor. I want to hear its roar and feel its tug as we cut loose from Earth's gravity and fly outward into space. (laughs) That might be a moment in which I'd share your sentimentality. Press your button now, sir. Thank you. Wilkins, I'm beginning to distrust you. If this is all a hoax, 
When are we going to take off? You said at five sharp, and it's two minutes after five now. Well, do we move or don't we? Mr. Crowder, we're already moving. The button you pushed was to nullify the effects of acceleration. If you don't mind, sir, I'd like to open the screen again. Now, if you care to look, see for yourself. Wilkins, we're in space. Look down at the Earth, how far we've come. Why, it's no bigger than a toy balloon. No, a dime. No, a firefly. Man, man, Wilkins, you've done it. Yes. I swore to be the first man to conquer space, and I've done it. It's a triumph of power and ambition. And sentiment. Blast sentiment. Your maudlin dreaming would have died unborn except for me. I made this possible, Wilkins. Don't you ever forget that? My capital, my forcefulness, my will. Look out there. Space. Stars that never were seen from Earth. This is only the beginning. We'll build a larger model. One great enough to hold a hundred men, a thousand, and cargo besides. Whoever wants to leave Earth this moment must come to me. I am the master of the planets. <sighs> All right, Wilkins. Turn back now. No. What? I said turn back. No. Well, we've, we've proved the ship can fly now. Now turn back. I want to start work at once in preparation for the long flights to come. Not so. We will go on. What are you doing? Defying me? I'll break your puny little body into pieces. Can you control this ship, Mr. Crowder? Would you like to be stranded out here in space, just adrift in space without control? Would you like that? Turn back. No. What's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? Oh, I am a sentimentalist, Mr. Crowder. Your money and ambition paved the way, that's true. But sentiment was the vital factor that sent me to you. Sentiment, sir. You see, Mr. Crowder, I wanted to go home. Home? Home? You are out of your mind. You will forgive me if I remove these primitive clothes? Oh. Oh. Who are you? Oh, it's all right, Mr. Crowder. I hold no special malice toward you. There's no need to be so terrified because you've had your first close look at a Martian. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Vital Factor by Nelson Bond, as adapted for radio by Howard Rodman. Featured in the cast were Joe DeSantis, Guy Sorrell, John McGovern, Rant Richards, Louis Van Ruten, Richard Hamilton, and Florence Williams. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production.